Chapter 20. The U.S. prison population was 1.5 million prisoners at year-end 2017, and the population of jail inmates in the U.S. was 745,000 mid-2017. There were 1.3 million prisoners under state jurisdiction and 180,000 under federal jurisdiction. From the end of 2016 to the end of 2017, the number of prisoners under federal jurisdiction dropped by 6,100, down 3% while the number of prisoners under state jurisdiction fell by 21,600, down 1%. By citizenship status, non-citizens made up roughly the same portion of the U.S. prison population, 7.61%. As of the total U.S. population, 7.0% per the U.S. Census Bureau. These numbers are based on prisoners held in the custody of publicly or privately operated state or federal prisons. The imprisonment rate for sentenced black males was more than twice the rate for sentenced Hispanic males and almost six times that for sentenced white males. 12,336 per 100,000 black males compared to 1,054 per 100,000 Hispanic males and 347 per 100,000 white males. At the end of fiscal year 2017, nearly half of all federal prisoners were serving a sentence for drug trafficking. While the numbers are falling, many federal prisons are still overcrowded. With overcrowding comes agitation. With agitation, violence. Most of the violence is relegated to U.S. penitentiaries, maximum security prisons like USP Big Sandy, which house mostly high security offenders. USP Florence, located in Colorado, saw a massive riot between white and black prisoners on April 20, 2008. Some white supremacist convicts were celebrating the birthday of Adolf Hitler with prison-made moonshine out on the recreation yard. At some point, the white outlaws began yelling racial epithets at black prisoners. The white supremacists armed themselves with rocks, prison shanks, and other improvised weapons. A battle between both races ensued. It involved over 200 prisoners and lasted more than 30 minutes. In an attempt to stop the riot, guards fired more than 200 M16 rounds, 300 pepper balls, 10 tear gas canisters, and sting grenades. When the dust settled, two prisoners, Philip Lee Hooker, and Brian Scott Kubiak lay dead from gunshot wounds. Over 30 prisoners and one staff member were also injured in the free-for-all. Maximum security federal prisons reeked with violence. Soon after the riot, Sarah Devley, the warden at Florence, received an Excellence in Prison Management Award. One of the biggest problems I see being part of this federal prison system is that there is no accountability. No one cares if prisoners are killed or assaulted. August 10, 2008, shortly after the riot, Another prisoner took a life at the Florence prison. The violence at Florence also extends to the visiting room. A prisoner took a homemade weapon to the visiting room with him. He cut his wife's neck, then turned his anger toward his mother-in-law. Both left the prison visiting room with superficial wounds while the warden enjoyed her award. 2008 seemed to be a rocking year for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. On June 28, 2008, prison guard Jose Rivera was stabbed at least 28 times with an 8-inch ice pick-like weapon. Two prisoners already serving life sentences were charged with his murder. After a three-month lockdown where prisoners were confined to their cells eating bologna sandwiches twice a day, they were finally let out of their cells. With all the pent-up anger, frustration, and hostility, it did not take long for more violence to erupt. Over a dozen prisoners were stabbed and the prison was plagued by numerous fights. The prison was placed on lockdown again. In 2017, there were 57 prisoner-on-staff assaults at USP Atwater. These included physical attacks with fists, food trays, and spitting or throwing urine on guards. More than half of those assaults took place in the special housing unit. Not long after Rivera's murder, stab-proof vests were issued to staff. Prisoners like me must find ways to protect our vital organs on our own. USP Pollock in Louisiana is another prison rife with violence. In April 2007, Tyrone Johnson and Derek Sparks were both murdered, stabbed with prison shanks. Not only was Pollock the leader in prisoner-on-prisoner -prisoner murders in 2007, but nothing good ever happens there. A few months after the Johnson and Sparks murders, two more prisoners were stabbed in the stomach. With Thanksgiving right around the corner in November 2007, two more prisoners left this cold world with toe tags on, William Bullock and Donald Till, murdered by other prisoners. Peter Avalos Gutierrez went to meet his maker in January 2008 at the age of 55, after being stabbed to death with a menacing shank. In Texas, Gabriel N. Roan was stabbed to death at USP Beaumont, also known as Bloody Beaumont. During the battle, a guard received 13 puncture wounds. 
there is a guard shortage problem in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Wherever the maximum security prisons are, there is also death. The great state of West Virginia is not exempt from prisoner-on-prisoner murders. In April 2018, 48-year-old Ian Thorne was killed during a physical altercation at USP Hazleton. Demario Porter, like Thorne, was killed the same way five months later. This has been going on for years. In February 2015, another prisoner met his fate at the prison when he was stabbed in the stomach. In 2016, prosecutors brought charges against a prisoner after he wrapped his hands around another prisoner's throat and strangled him to death. USP Hazleton, a place known for death and destruction, saw its most famous murder when former Irish mob boss James Whitey Bulger was viciously beat to death by at least two younger prisoners at the age of 89. Bulger had only been at the prison for a matter of hours. He was transferred from another prison in Florida after misconduct with staff allegations. Whitey Bulger was a high-publicity con, known as a snitch. Despite all of this, Whitey was sent to a prison known for murder. The minute he was designated to USP Hazleton, his death warrant was signed. Because Federal Bureau of Prison staff lack accountability, staff allow prisoners to be let off to gallows of another sort. Knives, shanks, steel pipes, fists, and feet. All tools used to send victims to the afterlife. Every day is just another day in the federal prison system. USP Big Sandy, what have you for me? Chapter 21 Oh, stop! What the fuck are you doing? The screaming reverberates through the vents as I brush my teeth. The wailing is coming from below. It travels through the ductwork. I am holding the toothbrush in my hand and staring into the mirror. I am intently focused. My attention to the screaming. Anger, depression, fear, anxiety all run through my veins. My life is this. Sometimes I wonder if this is a life at all or a life worth living. Hearing keys locking doors breaks my train of thought. I continue to brush my teeth. Once again, the officer is yelling the all-familiar, lock down. Sneakers squeak across the floor as prisoners scramble, gathering items owed and borrowed, magazines, food, and ice. Everyone seems to want ice when there is a lockdown. Lockdowns seem to be the norm now. Lockdowns are a sanctuary as long as they don't last weeks. Being locked in is a refuge from the day-to-day violence, the only real escape from the pain. This lockdown only lasts a few hours. Dinky and his misfits were at it again. They decided to hit another white prisoner from the south. He was in the unit below me. According to Dinky, the man had been writing to a prosecutor attempting to cooperate on an unsolved murder. Dinky unveiled this sin claiming he was able to read the imprint on the cover of his victim's writing pad. Simply an excuse made up in his mind. The real reason for his strike was the man had a store. Plenty of post-it stamps, food, pornography, and books. Dinky wanted all the fruits of his Mark's labor. Obtaining these fruits could be achieved through violence. Another sad day for someone on Magic Mountain. The smell of deep-fried food radiates through the unit, making my stomach growl. Someone is making fried food. Like Scooby looking for a Scooby snack, I want to find out who is cooking. Is it for sale? Determined to discover the source, I follow my nose. As luck would have it, two Serenios who I get along with are deep-frying the stuffed flour tortillas they call chimichangas. I order four with a cold soda. For a split second, I am reminded of the days when I was a small boy enjoying fried food at a carnival. The chimichangas are filled with cheese, chicken, peppers, and onions, all items stolen from the kitchen. I pay for the food with a book of stamps, thanking them as I leave. Everyone has a hustle in here, like red... The Serenios made a stinger out of wires and stainless steel. They took a hard plastic garbage can, cut it down with dental flaws, and turned it into a deep fryer. People deep fry raw chicken purchased from whoever can steal meat from the kitchen. Convicts who work as butchers have everything for sale. Beef, pork, hamburgers, chicken patties, and fish. Regular kitchen workers sell vegetables, fruits, raw rice, pasta, pre-made sandwiches, oatmeal, and desserts. The three things that people care about in here are food, drugs, and alcohol. The men that are hustling are doing so mostly for one of the three. Those selling drugs in here at the higher level are doing so not only to live well behind these walls, but also to pay for lawyers. They call these acts penitentiary chances. Penitentiary chances are chances people take selling drugs inside that could result in new criminal charges or death. In here, when you're the man with drugs and money, you become a target of those thirsty for what you have. You have what the vultures want. Overzealous guards, the few who aren't scared, also target the drug dealers. With the drugs comes mountains of problems. The problems are worth the risk when you're chasing freedom. 
Two doors down from me, another guy sells what people refer to as spitterets or chew ports. Tobacco products are no longer sold in the commissary in federal prison. Many of the guards chew tobacco. They carry empty soda bottles that they spit in, along with the chew that has been in their mouths. When those bottles go into the trash, a few select prisoners with access to the garbage snag the bottles. Like an episode from a scientific show, they set up a lab in their cells. First, they pour the discarded saliva from the chew. Then they place the plastic covers over a hot bowl of water, where they put the spit and chew, allowing it to dry. Once it is dry, they have what they call black gold, a big pile of chew that they turn into small spitterets. Each one sells for a book of stamps. One discarded bottle can fetch anywhere from 6 to 30 books of stamps. The thought that anyone would smoke anything that came from someone else's mouth makes me want to vomit. Everything is for sale. Food, drugs, alcohol, legal advice, pornography, even sex. We're hanging out in Red Cell, Red, Frank, and me. The music plays loudly as we laugh and joke among ourselves. Frank has been here for over a month, slowly acclimating to his new living arrangements. Dennis, Adam, Steve, and some of the other fellas came over to meet Frank on his second day. He never made it to breakfast that morning, so they showed up in the unit. After that morning, Frank never missed another breakfast. Chad, do you think you're ever going to get out of here, Frank asked me. This rat hole, I respond. No, man, I mean out of prison in general, Frank says, a look of despair on his face. Rubbing my thumb on my chin, I stall for a moment before I answer. Praying and hoping, because I can't take much more of this shit. Whenever I think about my case or the situation I'm in, my throat gets dry. I continue. Listen, Frank, I got a phenomenal lawyer from New York handling my appeal. She's Jewish, and Jews are good lawyers. Chick lawyers are always smarter than men, plus women care about people more, you know? She works at a law clinic in New York, too, so that's a good thing. Do you think they respect female lawyers, Frank asks? Jewish chicks named Jillian they do, I say with a laugh, trying to end the conversation about my case. You ever see what she looks like? Why? You trying to date my lawyer, jerk off? Come on, man. I'm just asking, kid. Nah, I ain't never seen her, but she has that New York City accent like Rosie Perez from White Men Can't Jump. Red and Frank laugh. Red says, that movie sucks, but I hope that Jewish chick gets you out of here, Chad. That makes at least two of us, Red. Me too, Frank chimes in. I want you to get out of here. Red's country music blares through his homemade speaker. First thing I remember knowing was a lonesome whistle blowing. Was a lonesome whistle blowing and a youngin's dream of growing up. Mama tried. I turned 21 in prison doing life without parole. No one could steer me right, but Mama tried. Mama tried. Mama tried to raise me better, but her pleading, I denied. With the conversation we are having, I think Merle Haggard's Mama Tried is a hell of a tune to be playing. My mother tried too. It was my own decisions that resulted in me being 24 doing 40 years without parole. Silently, I pray my attorney can win my appeal. My sanity rests on hope in the success of that appeal. That's the deuces, bro, Red says. We all stand up and look out the window into the recreation yard. Nothing there. We peer deeper into the yard. The yard is calm. A lake on a warm summer night. Yelling and squeaking sneakers pulls our attention from the window to our unit. When Red opens the door, the noise engulfs us. I see a white prisoner running down the range with blood dripping from his nose. Instantly, I am ready to pounce. Red senses my uncomfortableness. He grabs my shirt. That's the white dude, dog. He's with the blacks. I freeze as what Red says registers. He's with the blacks. The first thing I think is some black prisoners are attacking a white prisoner. If that were to happen, stalling could cost me or others our lives. In this place, you have to meet violence with violence. Dog is hemmed up by two armed gang members. He looks like he's being stabbed, but it does not stop him from returning fire with his fists. A heated battle ensues. Dog throws lefts and rights at a guy named Josh. I cheer inside for him, willing him to win. He moves to the left with the wall covering his back and throws an overhand right. With the agility of a professional fighter, he moves to the right, throws a jab, and follows it up with a hard right. A left uppercut next. Josh crashes to the floor, a heap of clothes. A knife tumbles from his hand, clanking, skittering across the concrete floor. Dog is ready to pounce on Josh. His knockout punch appears to have escalated his fury. Josh's partner disappears momentarily. He reappears with a broom. The first swing misses. Dog weaves away from the strike. The second swing comes fast, and it hits Dog in the head. As he stumbles back, he shakes his head trying to get his bearings back. Dog's too late. A third swing to the body. The fourth, a crushing blow to his head, sends Dog to his knees. His eyes lock onto mine, pleading for me to help him. I cannot help him. He made his choice a long time ago. 
Josh is back on his feet, knife in his hand. The shank strikes dog in the neck. Blood spills like a broken faucet. His adrenaline enables him to make it to his feet. With one hand on his neck, he sprints toward the guard's office. His pursuers give chase. As is custom, the deuces have brought staff flooding into the unit. Dog is able to run through the unlocked door into the arms of those able to save him. Josh and his partner are ordered on the wall. After a quick pat frisk, they are handcuffed and led out of the unit to the special housing unit. Before the yelling begins, I make my way to my cell. Mr. Young is already there. Before long, I hear the hard steel locked door clank behind me. This time, I don't feel the regular relief. A piece of me is burning hard. I feel as if a part of me is transforming, taking me to a place where I could hurt Josh and his friend with no remorse. Fire should be met with fire, anger with anger, violence with violence, ruthlessness with ruthlessness. Big Sandy can turn a good heart black. I look out the window in my cell door. I see blood everywhere. There is more than I would have thought. Other prisoners are ignoring the call for a lockdown. Instead, they are going to the showers and filling garbage bags with ice to keep any perishables cold for as long as they can. Others stop off at the store man's cell. Our store man is a black man from D.C. named Bo. Bo sells commissary items from his cell. Everything from cold sodas to chips, cheese, cookies, and meats. The markup is about 35 cents on every dollar. As I stare out the window at the commotion, I think about Dog. I spoke to him on many occasions. He often talked about his son and his daughter and how he was looking forward to getting out of here so he could spend time being a dad. Dog was a likable guy in his 30s, serving seven years for weapons possession. Originally from New Jersey, he relocated to Tennessee. Now he might have lost his life here in Kentucky. While my heart is beginning to darken, there is still a part with kindness. My kindness allows me to hope that Dog makes it, that his life, his hope to be a father, does not end here. If Dog dies, I know this lockdown will not be short. Watching the attack on Dog made me want to intervene, but there was no way I could. Dog is Irish like me, from New Jersey, but he made a mistake when his feet hit the soil here. He made a choice to ride with the blacks. Once he did that, he was dead to the white prisoners. He was now considered black. Whites don't get involved in black business, and blacks don't get involved in white business. Dog came to Big Sandy prior to Adam and Steve's arrival. Had he come here after those two showed up, he would have been in our car. In our car, the likelihood of two white gang members stabbing him would have been low. Had they done so, we would have come together and massacred both Josh and his partner. After watching Dog's incident with no blacks intervening, I am unsure if they knew he was part of their car. Most people assume that Dog rode with the blacks. Dog probably liked it that way. Two black prisoners in our unit usually sit at the same table with Dog in the mess hall. One of them is from New Jersey. The other is from Brooklyn, New York. Neither man came to his aid. Like everyone else, they were simply spectators, not participants. I feel a disdain for both prisoners for not intervening, or at least making sure that Dog had a fair shake. Maybe they knew this was going to happen before it took place, and were ordered by the shot caller not to get involved. The prison is locked down, again. Looking out my cell window, I see two other prisoners dressed in white suits that resemble astronaut uniforms. These are the only two convicts out and about in the prison. They are here to clean up the blood. Both are designated to clean up blood and other bodily fluids. There is no shortage of work here at Big Sandy for the men in the moon suits. According to prison standards, this is one of the best jobs to have, in large part because it pays well. The assignment pays a little over $100 a month. I would never think twice about a job like that. Disease runs rampant among prisoners behind these dark walls. HIV and hepatitis are at the top of the list. That alone makes the blood duty undesirable to me. The $100 lures others in, though. We're on our fourth day of the lockdown when Mr. Young appears to have a nervous breakdown. It started this morning, shortly after guards shoved paper bag breakfast into our cell. He was angry that the bags had one apple, two pieces of bread, and a pack of powdered milk. How's a man supposed to survive on that? He could not understand. When two raggedy bags come in for lunch with more of the same, Mr. Young punches the door. The sound of his fist hitting the hard metal pulls me from the James Patterson book I am reading. Mr. Young's left arm rests at the top of the door. Staring at the back of his head, I hear him weeping. Big Sandy has broken this old man. A Vietnam veteran who saw combat has been shattered by the violence, loneliness, and desperation that engulfs this small area of the bluegrass state. He stands at the door crying, rambling about his age and how this whole system is wrong. Both of our brown bags are on the floor. 
I can do nothing but lend an ear, listen to his sorrow. My heart hurts to see Mr. Young brought to tears. From Vietnam to federal prison, this is what his life has become. I'm 63 years old, Chad. I should be watching my grandkids grow up, Mr. Young says between sniffles. With understanding in my voice, I respond, You're going to be all right, Mr. Young. Just hang in there, buddy. You'll be home before you know it. Chad, there just ain't no real men in this prison. Men make their own decisions, life decisions. You understand me, Chad? He says through clenched teeth, tears running down his cheeks. I can't walk out of this cell if I wanted to and call my family. I can't get myself anything to eat when I'm hungry. Do you understand that, young man? I nod in agreement, listening as he speaks. I understand, Mr. Young. This is a sad life, but we're going to be okay. I say this with some reservations. I want to make him feel better about our current circumstances. His words ring true in my ears. This is a very sad reality that I don't want to accept. We can't even get something to eat if we are hungry, which we are with the brown bags three times a day. The guards are yelling that it's shower time, prompting Mr. Young to speak again. Oh, so nice. It's been four days, and now they want to march us in cuffs to the shower? Showers might do him justice, calm his nerves, I hope. I like Mr. Young. I feel bad for him. There is a respect that I have for him like what a grandson might have for his own grandfather. Mr. Young has been in prison for seven years on a 15-year sentence for armed bank robbery. He swears up and down that he is not guilty. I believe him. Most people don't claim to be innocent. They complain about the draconian sentences that they received. Federal mandatory minimums have destroyed many lives by sending nonviolent offenders to places like this where they are forced to do what they have to do to survive behind this razor wire. Sometimes they are forced to become violent. Without violence, they too will be devoured. Shower time has finally arrived. The simple event brings much relief. Being able to walk out of our cell to stretch your legs brings with it a small amount of joy. Our unit manager, Miss Chase, is at our door with her secretary, Miss Hack, to cuff us up for showers. I put my back to the door, squat down, and send my hands through the slot to be cuffed. As Miss Hack cuffs me, her soft hands brush my fingers. Her perfume is light, but I can still smell it through the door. A normal person can never fathom how good it feels just to have a woman grab my hands while cuffing my wrist. The saying, there truly is nothing like a woman's touch, resonates in that small moment. Her Kentucky accent is soothing. Her politeness is delightful in such a contaminated place. This is the first time I have come in direct contact with a woman in many years. Hands cuffed behind me, I grab my towel and soap off the desk. The door opens, and Miss Hack escorts me to the shower. The hot water streams down my face, caressing my cheeks like a waterfall. Hot water, Mr. Young's breakdown, and the touch of a woman break me down. The smell of cold soap floods my locked concrete shower. My thoughts go to February 4, 2003, the life I once had. Snow, pristine, glistening in the light of the moon. I stop at the corner and look to the left. As I turn my head to the right, he's there running towards my truck, gun pointing straight at me. A car is in front of me. I cut the wheel to the left, but I can go nowhere. Another man with a mask and a chrome pistol. He is almost at the driver's side. In my panic, I assume I am being robbed. I take a moment to pray they do not kidnap me for ransom. I am trapped. They got me. And then I see the blue lights as more men jump out of police cars. The 9mm is pressed to my temple. I see the shiny piece of metal of a Rochester police badge in my peripheral vision. Orders are barked at me as I am ripped from the driver's seat and thrown to the hard, cold pavement. Snowflakes float down from the dark sky. I know it's all over. Booper's long gone. We parted ways when he turned 15. I found out he started smoking cocaine base. That was the excuse I used. Like Biggie said, blow up like the World Trade Center. Everything was blowing up as I lay in the cold, wet snow. The cuffs tighten on my wrist. I wish I were being robbed or kidnapped for a ransom. Anything else would be better than this reality. My stomach quivers as if I had just been hit with a left hook to the abdomen by Mike Tyson. I lay there sick and frightened. The cop tells me if I move, he'll shoot me in the head. I decide to stay motionless in the snow. As I rub the coast into the skin on my face, I begin my own silent weeping. This one thought brings back that whole experience once again. That same left hook to the stomach area hits me again, just as hard. The only thing that has changed is the date. Everything hurts all over again. The pain is still excruciating. Sometimes I think of her, not as much as before, but the fear, frustration, and faithlessness of Big Sandy makes her dance in my mind. At 24, I lost her. A beautiful wife, two little girls, Tierra and Joy, dancing to Michael Jackson's Thriller, watching Lilo and Stitch, The Lion King, 
Dora the Explorer, counting to ten in Spanish. Vivid memories. Jen was her name. Dinner at our favorite restaurant, Pasta Villa. Good conversations, laughs, good times. Life as I knew it, forever gone. Your life as you know it may very well be over. I think that's what the judge said. It's all a blur now. The salty tears run down my face. I punch the shower wall, hard, over and over. My eyes burn like hot coals as the emotions run over me. Nothing left but shattered memories and dreams. No one to blame for the losses but myself, my irrational and irresponsible decisions. Let's go, man. You have two minutes. Other people need to shower. A male guard's voice rings out. Defiantly, another prisoner yells, Fuck you. Yeah, all right, the guard sneers back. This exchange brings me back to Big Sandy. I try to calm myself. I rinse my face carefully. I'm not going to let anyone see me in this state, this moment of weakness. Not even Mr. Young. Surely not Miss Hack. (laughs) 